So last week we had a preview of this Axios interview between Donald Trump and Jonathan Swan, which aired last night. I reviewed the full interview and this is truly the stuff of legends. I actually my vocabulary was not uh, powerful enough to accurately describe the contents of this interview. So I had to spend a bunch of time today reading Jack London in order to expand my vocabulary to be better prepared to describe what it is that we are about to see. That's a joke, by the way. This may actually be the most damaging interview to Donald Trump that I have ever seen. If you thought the Chris Wallace interview two weeks and two days ago on Fox News Sunday was bad, and it was. This is arguably even worse. And what's particularly spectacular about this interview is that Jonathan Swan calls out and confronts Donald Trump on all those things I've been saying during the last five months of coronavirus. Somebody has to call him out. Somebody has to confront him. Well, Jonathan Swan did it when Trump lied about we have the lowest death rate. Jonathan Swan checked receipts and had Trump pulling out papers that Trump didn't even understand. When Trump uses his bogus talking points or phrases like people are saying, Jonathan Swan says, who is saying? Tell me exactly who is saying. And Trump is never actually able to say referring to vague books or whatever, Let which Trump doesn't read. Let's look at some of this and we'll talk through it. Here's a series of hilarious fact checks and weird claims from Trump during the vote by mail portion of the interview. And Trump tries to claim that absentee and mail in are two different things in this election. Swan says it's the same thing. Trump says vote by mail is new. Swan says it's been around since the Civil War. This is really, really great stuff. We have a new phenomena. It's called in. It's called mail in voting where you send where new. a governor it's well, been here since the Civil War. In terms of the kind of, do, uh, the kind of millions and millions of ballots, they've never. Done it'll be it'll be like bigger this. this year because of the pandemic. Bigger, not bigger, massively bigger. Yeah, because of the so pandemic. So they're going to send tens of millions of ballots to California, all over the place. Who, who's going to get them? I have a friend who lives in Westchester County. They send applications having to do with universal mail-in voting. Absentee voting is okay. You have to apply. You have to go through a process. You have to apply for mail-in. Absentee mail voting it's the same is thing. good. Look. Look, okay, let's, do let's do concrete. Let's do concrete. They're sending out applications. Download them millions of ballots. No, they're not. There it's is, applications. You can there get them is the no way you can go through a mail in vote without massive cheating. I honestly don't understand this topic with, with go you. Ahead. The Republican Party has an extremely well funded vote by mail program. Your campaign puts out emails telling people to vote by mail. Correct. Your daughter-in-law, Lara Trump, she did robocalls in California saying it's safe and secure, mail-in voting. Let, I, let me tell you. The Republican we have won. No choice. That was an all-mail-in race. Let me tell you. We went through World War II. You yeah. went to the polls. You've had mail-in voting since the Civil War. because of the China virus, we're supposed to stay home, <laughs> send millions of ballots all over the country, millions and millions. You know, you could have a case where this election won't be decided on the evening of November 3rd. Absolutely. This election could what's be wrong decided with that? two months later. It won't be two months, but what's wrong with the proper it mailing count? It could be count? decided many months later. I have to use the phrase, it's a verbal ink blot test. It's just throwing stuff all over the place. Trump is frequently using this thing. We might not know the results on election night. OK. I mean, shouldn't we prioritize accuracy over speed? Like, why would it be so bad if we didn't know the results? On election night, is it that Trump won't be able to sleep for five days, not knowing that it's conceivable that he may not knowing that he may have lost the election? Now, then a ton of the interview was about coronavirus. And this is a portion that we're going to want to look at very closely. Donald Trump start making incorrect starts making incorrect claims about deaths in the United States and actually pulls out paper. So let's step through it one piece at a time, because this is really historically embarrassing stuff. Now, if you're watching and not just listening, you're going to notice that as Donald Trump is looking at various charts and graphs that he pulls out, he seems to even struggle what it is that he's looking at and ends up handing stuff to Jonathan Swan. Take a look at this. Take a look at some of these charts. I'd love to. We're going to look. Let's look. And if you look at death, yeah, started to go up again. One. Well, right here, the United States is lowest in numerous categories. Uh, we're lower than the world. Lower than we're the lower world. Lower than what is that? Europe. In what? Look. In what? So this is already amazing. Donald Trump says 
we are lower than the world. And Jonathan Swan is visibly confused and says, what what does that even mean? We're lower than the world in what? And so then Trump starts handing papers to Jonathan Swan and things start to escalate very quickly. Take a look right here. Here's case death. Oh, you're doing death as a proportion of cases. I'm talking about death as a proportion of population. That's where the U.S. is really bad. Well, well, Much worse than South Korea, Germany, etc. You can't. You can't do that. You have Why to go. Do you that? have to go by. You have to go by where. Look, here is the United States. You have to go by the cases. The cases. Why are not dead. as a proportion when of population? When we have somebody, what it says is when you have somebody that yeah. has it, where there's a case. Oh, okay. The people that live sure. from oh. those cases. This is brilliant. I mean, this, this is just this is exactly the confrontation that Donald Trump has needed all along. Trump continues to insist that the reason our numbers are skewed are the number of tests that we do. And he keeps talking about our death rate relative to the testing rate. I, I've talked about this before. The case fatality rate is a rate of deaths relative to tests. And Trump continues to insist that testing skews numbers, which is what he says is actually the problem. And Swan points out, you know, deaths per population, not deaths per test is really what matters. And Trump is just barely able to even keep up cognitively. It's surely a relevant statistic to say if the U.S. has X population and X percentage of death of that population no, versus you South have to Korea. No, go by the cases. Well, look at South Korea, yeah. for example. 51 million population, 300 deaths. It's like, it's you, crazy. You compared don't to know that. I do. It's you on the, don't know it's, that. Don't, you think they're faking their statistics, uh, South Korea? I, I, an I won't get into country? that because they have a very good relationship yeah. with the country. But you don't know that. Now, that's a really important moment. This is sort of a white flag moment for Trump. When you can't argue the facts anymore, when you've been beaten on the facts and your arguments, if you can even call them that, fall apart, you call into question whether we can believe anything, whether we can know anything. Like this is a complete white flag because it stops the conversation. It's actually a really common crutch. It's a basic epistemological question that, in a sense, we can always ask, right? You can always turn to how do we know anything? How can we? Uh, uh, what what really is true? Can we know anything? But this is a crutch that stops the conversation because it's like, well, then uh, anything you're saying is also subject to that same question. It is a white flag when it is an interview about facts. At any point you want, you can always say, how do we know any fact is true? OK, but that's not really where you go if the facts are on your side and if you're able to put coherently put together an argument and Trump then goes back to holding up pieces of paper that even he doesn't understand and just continues handing them to the interviewer. And they have spikes. Look, here's Germany one low. Here's 9, one. Here's one right here. United States. You take anyway. the number of cases. Okay. Look, we're last, meaning we're first. Last? I don't know we what we're first in. As a take a look okay. again. It's cases. Just, OK. Um, and we have cases. Because I mean, of the testing. a thousand Americans are dying a day, but I understand. I understand on cases it's different. No, but you're not reporting it correctly, Jonathan. I think I am, but if you take a look at this other chart, okay. look, this is our testing. I believe this is the testing. Yeah. Yeah, we do more tests. No, wait a minute. Well, don't we get credit for that? And because we do more tests, we have more cases. In other words, we test more. We have. But, now take a look. The top one. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. But, the top, Jonathan. If if if, if hospital rates were going down and deaths were going down, I'd say terrific. You deserve to be praised for well, testing. They but even, they're all going you know, up. They very rarely Hosp talk. Sixty thousand Americans are in hospital. If you watch the news or dying read the papers. They usually talk about new cases, new cases, new cases. I'm talking about death. Well, you look it's at going death. Up. Death is way down from where it was. It's it's a thousand death. a day. It was two and a half thousand. It went down to five hundred. Now it's going up death. again. The scariest part about this is that under the most basic questioning, like these are simple pushbacks from Jonathan Swan. These aren't gotchas. This is what Trump should have been confronted with all along. He immediately becomes incoherent. He has to fall back on repeating things that don't make sense. And you really get the sense that Trump doesn't understand what's going on. Yes, he also doesn't care, but it's not just that he doesn't care. He also doesn't get it. He can't parse the data. He can't understand the facts. And here Trump is confronted about his constant refrain that coronavirus is, quote, under control when it's very clearly completely out of control. And take a look at Donald Trump's response. 
They listen to every word you say. They hang on your every word. They don't listen to me or the media or Fauci. They think we're fake news. They want to get their advice from you. And so when they hear you say everything's under control, don't worry about wearing masks, I mean, these are people, many of them are older people, well, Mr. President. What's your definition of control? Yeah. Under the it's giving them a false sense right of security. Now, I think it's under control. I'll tell you what. How? A thousand Americans are dying a day. They are dying. That's true. And you ha it is what it is. But that doesn't mean we aren't doing everything we can. It's under control. That's really bad, right? I mean, a thousand deaths a day. This interview was recorded a week ago. We've had a couple 14, 1500 death days since. And Trump says, well, it is what it is, but it's under control. Either Donald Trump doesn't understand language or he will not concede ever that this may not be under control. But ju Trump just repeats it's under control. The deaths, they are what they are, but it's under control. It's like language has no meaning anymore. And then they get back into testing and cases. Take a look at that. I mean, I've no, heard you say this, other but countries don't test like we do, do so they don't show cases. Just a couple of points on that. I wasn't going to continue on the testing, but you said it. So we're testing so much because it's spread so far in America. We're testing and when so you... much because we had the ability to test okay. because we but, came up with tests. But South Korea. Jonathan, we weren't even, we didn't even have a test. When I took over, we didn't even have a test. Now, in all why, fairness, why would you there have a was test? no test The virus didn't this... exist. How would Excuse you have a test? I was say, okay. There was no test for this. No, we didn't have a test because there was no of test. Of course. In, in a very short order, we got one test, we got another test. It we was got broken another. the first Many one. of those tests are now obsolete because we've, right. you know, it's called science and all of a sudden right. something's better. So Jonathan Swan here doing a good job of calling out the talking point that Trump keeps using that before Trump was in office, there was no test for coronavirus. Yeah, that's right. It's a novel virus. It's called uh, uh, COVID-19 because of the year 2019. And sometimes it seems Trump is trying to use this phrase. We had no test when I took over to place blame on Obama, which is really crazy. But sometimes what Trump tries to use that talking point for is to say that the U.S. was in a uniquely difficult position relative to other countries. Listen, we didn't have a test when I became president, but that was the case for every country. In other words, it was not just the U.S that was facing a novel coronavirus with no test. No other country had a test for it because it was a novel coronavirus. Nobody had a test. And yet other countries were able to get the virus under control. Let's keep going in this part of the interview. But because we tested so many people, 55, 60 million people very soon, we get cases. You test some kid has even just a little runny nose. It's a case. And then you report many cases. So we look like we have more cases than massive countries yeah. like China, which, by the way, doesn't report, as you know. Well, I, like, I don't put any stock in China's no, no, figures. The point, is, yeah. the point is, because we are so much better at testing than any other country in the world, we show more cases. Now, as you probably know by now, if you've been watching my show, this is not true. In terms of per capita testing, the United States has now crept up to 18th in the world. But the important thing to understand, as Jonathan Swan attempted to point out earlier, is that at this point, a lot of countries don't need to test. So now arguing we are doing the most testing, even if true, which it's not, is no longer equally relevant because the game is to develop a testing program early. There are many countries now that the U.S. is passing in tests per capita over time because those countries don't have sim people with symptoms. They don't have people to test because they have so few cases early on. Remember when we were 50th, 55th in testing per capita, that was the time to be testing to, to, to suppress the spread of the virus. Many countries have done that. So at this point, even bragging about our testing per capita rate becomes less relevant because even though it's still only 18th in the world, a lot of the countries we've passed since the countries that are 25th, 30th, 40th in testing per capita, they don't have anybody to test anymore because they have so few cases. It's all just basic critical thinking and stats stuff from high school that Trump doesn't get. Now, at one point, Donald Trump was asked about the recent passing of Congressman John Lewis, a civil rights hero who Trump barely acknowledged previously. And check out what Donald Trump says, immediately making it all about him. John Lewis is lying in state in the U.S. Capitol. How do you think history will remember John Lewis? I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know John Lewis. Uh, he chose not to come to my uh, uh, inauguration. 
Uh, he chose. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I never met John Lewis, actually. I don't believe. Do you find him impressive? Uh, I can't say one way or the other. I find a lot of people impressive. I find many people not impressive. But no. But I didn't. Do go. you find his story he impressive? Come, he didn't come to my inauguration. He didn't come to my State of the Union speeches, and that's okay. That's his right. And. Again, nobody has done more right. but, for but black to, Americans than I have. I understand. He should have come. But back, I think he made a big mistake. But, but, ta I think he but taking come. your relationship with him out of it, do you find his story impressive, what he's done for this country? He was a person that devoted a lot of energy and a lot of heart to civil rights, but there were many others also. I don't know him. He didn't come to my inauguration, he says twice. Uh, and I am the savior of black people is what Donald Trump manages to turn that into. Trump cannot comment on anything outside of his own relationship to the person or the event or the material in question. And Trump doesn't all lives matter here. This is equivalent to all lives matter. Trump is asked about John Lewis's contributions to civil rights. And Trump says lots of people contributed to civil rights. That is again like, well, we're we're talking here about the victims of the Boston Marathon. Well, but people also died in 9 11. Uh, OK, it, it, what? What? Black lives matter. Well, all lives matter. OK, yeah, but we're talking about black lives right now. What about John Lewis, who just passed away's contributions to civil rights? Many people worked on civil rights sick, really, really sick. And then here's our sort of uh, dessert, our denouement. Trump once again wishing well to a serial accused child sex trafficker. Gilene Maxwell. Nice way to cap off the interview. No, all over the country. Mr. President, the other day a reporter asked you about Ghislaine Maxwell. You said, quote, I just wish her well, frankly. I've met her numerous times over the years, especially since I lived in Palm Beach, but I wish her well, whatever it is. Mr. President, Ghislaine Maxwell has been arrested on allegations of child sex trafficking. Why would you wish such a well, person first of all, well? I don't know that, but I do know that. She has. She's been arrested for that. Her you know that. friend or boyfriend. Epstein was either killed or committed suicide in jail. She's now in jail. Uh -huh. Yeah, I wish you well. I'd wish you well. I'd wish a lot of people well. Good luck. Let them prove somebody was guilty. I mean, you do you know that oh, she's Oh, so you're guilty? saying you hope she doesn't die in jail. Is that what you mean by wish her well? Her boyfriend died in jail, and people are still trying to figure out how did it happen? Was it suicide? Was he killed? And I do wish her well. I'm not looking for anything bad for her. I'm not looking bad for anybody. And they took that and I mean, they she's made a it child, such, such child, a big though. deal. But all it is is right. her boyfriend died. He died in jail. Was he killed? Was it suicide? I do. I wish her well. Famous last words, maybe, from Donald Trump. I have never seen anything like this. I thought 16 days ago that the Fox News Chris Wallace interview was rock bottom as far as interviews are concerned. No, this is far, far worse. Let me know your thoughts. I'm on Twitter at D Pacman. And remember that you can get the daily audio uh, podcast, excuse me, the daily audio podcast of the show every single day, right around 3 p.m. Eastern time on whatever is your favorite podcasting app, Spotify, Google Play, Pandora, iHeartRadio, iTunes, Whichever you prefer, get the daily audio podcast. We'll take a quick break and be right back. Real quick, I want to tell you about our sponsor, Magic Spoon, who have done something awesome. They've taken all of our favorite sugary childhood cereals that we know we shouldn't eat anymore and turned them into something you can actually feel good about eating as an adult. There's four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted and blueberry. They taste great. They're crunchy. They're sweet like you would expect this type of cereal to be. But it's perfect for a ketogenic diet because one bowl has only three net carbs, 12 grams of protein. It's sugar free, gluten free, grain free, soy free. Once our team tried Magic Spoon for the first time, we actually ended up emailing Magic Spoon back and saying, can you send us more boxes, send more samples? They've been a big hit with uh, David Pakman show staffers and Magic Spoon knows how delicious their cereal is, because if you don't like it, They'll refund all of your money, no questions asked, and you'll get free shipping when you go to magicspoon.com slash Pacman and use the code Pacman. That's P-A-K-M-A-N.